Robert Emmons is professor of psychology at the University of California, Davis, where he has taught since 1988. He is a celebrated author of nearly 200 original publications in peer-reviewed journals or chapters, and has written or edited several books, including his most recent, Gratitude Works, a 21-day program for creating emotional prosperity. A leader in the positive psychology movement, Dr. Emmons is founding editor and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Positive Psychology. His research focuses on the psychology of gratitude and thankfulness in both adults and youth, and how they are related to human flourishing. His interests also include the psychology and spirituality of joy and grace as they relate to human flourishing. Dr. Emmons' work has been featured in dozens of popular media outlets, including the New York Times, Newsweek, NPR, and the Wall Street Journal. Well, it's gr really great to be with you guys today, and I'm really excited about talking about gratitude because it's what I do. It's what I've done for the last several years, really about a decade and a half. And just to have this opportunity to share the latest science, the latest findings about gratitude, it's really exciting. So uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate this uh, chance to just really kind of share with you the, the latest findings uh, on the science of gratitude. And really, we want to focus in on the, <clears throat> the healing power of gratitude, because it's really amazing what's been happening. There's really a... Um, a, a it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say there's a renaissance going on right now globally uh, in gratitude science and in the medical benefits of gratitude. There's really been a huge expansion in the science and practice of gratitude over the last several years. In fact, in the last five years, there are more studies published in peer-reviewed journals than in the previous 50 years combined. So it's been a huge uh, explosion, acceleration of research into the science and the practice of, of gratitude showing that gratitude is good medicine. You know, every day and in every way, we're learning more and more about how gratitude has a healing power. And uh, we don't want to reduce it, though, to just good medicine, because it's much more than that. It's much more than saying thank you. Uh, it's much more than a nice, warm, fuzzy uh, sentiment. It's also much more than, than a strategy for just being happier or uh, healthier. Because the way I think about gratitude is really uh, about life. It's about really living in truth, living authentically, because gratitude is the truest approach to life. I mean, think about it. After all, we don't manufacture ourselves. We've gotten to where we are because of the help and assistance of countless other people who have done things for us that we couldn't do for ourselves, or secured outcomes for us that we could not secure for ourselves. So, so we owe it to them to be grateful. We owe it to ourselves to reflect on life from a grateful lens or an appreciative lens. And gratitude really is just living in truth. It's the best and I think the truest approach to life. And I mean, that's one of the reasons why it works. Uh, we do wanna focus though today on the medical aspects of gratitude, that gratitude in many ways is, is good medicine. So I wanna begin <clears throat> simply by asking this question. This is what I wanna focus our attention on today. And that is what is the role of gratitude in healthcare? whether we look at it as a practice that some people engage in before they have a meal, for instance, and they, they say thank you, they give thanks, or they, they uh, engage in the saying of grace. It's a tradition, practice all over the world. Or as a deeper attitude, as a more fundamental uh, orientation toward life, you know, where everything is seen as a gift. Everything potentially is uh, really a gift, looking at one's life, one's health, just life itself uh, as a gift. That's the gratitude at the other extreme. So we can go from a habit, a practice, to a really fundamental life orientation or a personality trait of being grateful, of gratefulness. So gratitude, I just want to define it first. <clears throat> well, before I do that, actually I have this uh, quote, then we'll, we'll define gratitude. But uh, John Henry Jowett, uh, I don't think that's a name that's going to be familiar to most of you. Um, well, over a hundred years ago, said this about gratitude. He said that gratitude is a vaccine, an antitoxin, and an antiseptic. Interesting. Uh, Jowett was not a medical man. He was interested in caring for the soul. He was actually a um, Protestant uh, preacher and a minister. Uh, but yet he knew a lot about gratitude and potentially that it could, in fact, 
have a healing power to it. So he was in many ways a prophet uh, because what he said in this simple quote really has, has stood the test of time. Now we have the science that's ratifying and verifying this claim made by Jowett uh, about 150 years ago. So now I believe we will look at, there it is, what gratitude is, how I define it. You know, we all know what it is, right? It's being thankful, it's having this sense of appreciation Someone provides the benefit for you. Someone is nice to you, is kind for you, does a favor for you. And we feel the sense of warmness welling up inside of us. We want to express that gratitude. We want to acknowledge it, but also say thank you, express our own goodness for the goodness we've received from this other uh, individual or other moral agent, because it might not be just a person. It could be a spiritual being. It could be the universe. It could be uh, an animal. People are grateful to their pets, for example. So there's a wide variety of sources to whom we owe our thanks. I like to think of gratitude as um, existing along two planes or two dimensions, resulting from two stages of information processing. So first we have affirmation. We have affirming goodness. So gratitude begins with saying, you know, I have some good things in my life. It doesn't mean my life is perfect, that there's an absence of um, adversity or suffering necessarily, but all in all, there are some good things to recognize and to say, thank you for those good things. I recognize I could not do those good things for myself or provide those things to myself, that I required the efforts and kindness of other individuals. So affirmation and recognition are two important concepts. Recognizing is really important because gratitude, although it's a, it's a feeling, it's a warm feeling, an emotion, it's also a way of seeing. Gratitude is foundationally and fundamentally a way of seeing that alters our gaze. It helps us see life in terms of gifts and, and giftedness. We begin to look for the good, see the good in our lives, notice the good, give thanks for the good, recognize the sources of this goodness, these good things. So we have to know uh, who provided us with these benefits. We acknowledge that they did things for us that we couldn't necessarily do for ourselves. Uh, we remember who they are and what they did. There's an old saying, a French proverb, which says that gratitude is the memory of the heart. It's the way the heart remembers. So we have all these terms coming together, gratitude and thinking, knowing, acknowledging, remembering, recognizing. It really is a way of looking at life that leads to grateful feelings, in terms of the emotional component, but also does so much more when it comes to motivating us to give back, to inspire us, to give back the goodness that we've received, have received, and we continue to receive. You know, I began my research on gratitude way back, actually, 30 years ago, I began researching happiness when I was in graduate school. So the science of happiness actually predates uh, positive psychology by quite some time, by about a decade and a half. Even the study of gratitude predates the formal field of positive psychology. Happiness, or what we call back in the day subjective well-being, was my interest in working in, in graduate school with my mentor at the University of Illinois, who was the father of the science of subjective well-being. That was Professor Ed Diener. Um, my entry into gratitude was through the field of happiness studies and happiness science. And the big question that has intrigued me since that time is the one you see up there right now. Is expressing gratitude the key to unlocking happiness? You know, there's a lot of lock and key metaphors when it comes to gratitude. People have said things like gratitude is the key that opens all doors. Uh, they said something like, uh, one person said that there is one key that fits the lock to happiness, and that is gratitude. And so, um, there's great sayings and, and quotes and maxims and proverbs about the power of gratitude that go back millennia. So it's really fun to read those. And I you know, derive a lot of inspiration from those uh, sayings about the power of gratitude. That's the greatest of the virtues, the parent of the virtues. It's the secret to life. As one a prominent a thinker also stated about gratitude, there's lots and lots of sayings about it. The question for me becomes, does gratitude deliver on its promise? You know, what does the science tell us? about gratitude? Is it the strength? Is it the strongest of all the virtues? Is it the key that opens all doors? Uh, and so on. So that's what I have been devoting my last really decade and a half of research to trying to answer this sort of question. You know, there is a science and there's a whole industry of happiness out there right now. 
there's no shortage of advice uh, of people who want to give you their formula, their recipe for happiness, whether it's in, you know, 30 days, three hours, uh, 10 steps, seven secrets. There are recipes from various experts uh, who have, many of them have done this research or have distilled the research into a kind of list of to do's that if you do these things, three, four, five, six, seven things, this will guarantee for you a happy life, uh, a life of flourishing, your best life now. Okay. Uh, I came across uh, one article several months ago. It was entitled Eight Things Happy People Do every morning. Um, I have a presence on Twitter and other social media, so I came across this article and I started to read it. And the very first thing that was listed of these eight was that happy people, they practice gratitude. They wake up in the morning and they reflect on what they're grateful for. They say thank you to their partner. They write down uh, five things that they're grateful for. They're going to happen that day. I thought that's really great because that's what I've been uh, you know, preaching all along, the importance of gratitude. So I didn't read the other seven. I just stopped there. And I decided to kind of, without thinking too much about it, just retweet that to my followers uh, on Twitter. And then a friend of mine sent me a message and said, well, did you read the rest of the article? And I had to admit that I didn't. So I went back and looked at it. And it was quite a list, actually, to-do list of things that happy people do every morning. Beyond practicing gratitude, they would do some writing in a journal when they woke up. They would do some reading. They would uh, go outside and exercise. They would take the dog for a walk. They would um, retile the backsplash uh, behind their stove. They would install drought tolerant landscaping. I mean, it was a tremendous list of things that if you actually did all of these, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not that much. If you actually did all of these things, it would take you several hours. I mean, you'd have to get up 4 a.m. if you had a nine to five job just to accomplish everything that was on this list. Uh, about the same time, this friend of mine posted an article that was entitled, uh, The 14 Things That Successful People Do the First Thing Every Day. I mean, think about that one. 14 things that successful people do first thing every day in the morning. Now, you know, it was a well-intended article, but think about that. By the time you get to number five or six, let alone 13 or 14, it's no longer first thing in the morning. So that's the issue I have with these sorts of lists of to do's is that it's great advice if you have a life of leisure and you can engage in all these activities, but most of us are not so fortunate. We've got to get up. We've got places to go work to get to kids to bring to school and so on. The beautiful thing about gratitude is that it's available to everyone. You know, the practice of gratitude is accessible. It's available. You don't have to have all these hours of leisure to be able to implement these eight things or 12 things or 14 things. You're never too old, too young, too rich, too poor, too healthy, too sick, too whatever to practice gratitude. Everyone can start practicing gratitude no matter where they're at right now, today. And I think this is part of its appeal. So the reason why the science of gratitude has really expanded and accelerated is for two reasons. Number one, the growing database that we'll look at shortly, showing that gratitude matters, that it works in, in countless ways in people's lives, but also that it is very accessible. People understand that, they get that, they recognize that, they acknowledge that, they can practice that, they can start it, whether they're kids, whether they're older individuals, everyone in between. It's a very accessible strategy, tactic, for developing a better life. So with that, basic introduction uh, in mind, I want to talk about our research program over the years that I began by asking people simply to keep a journal. Gratitude journaling has become quite an industry in and of itself. Uh, we started, we did the initial studies, now laboratories around the country, even around the world, have expanded and extended our findings in a number of very interesting domains. Uh, I'd say roughly 3,000 individuals have participated in these studies between the ages of 8 and 80, so from kids. We started with um, third graders all the way up to people in, the, in their 80s, and even a few people beyond that have been in these uh, studies where they were randomly assigned. It really you know, uh, met the, the, the gold standard for good medical research, random assignment, 
placebo-controlled experimental trials where they were randomly assigned to either keep a gratitude journal or do something else. So we've had various comparison conditions, whether they were writing about things going wrong in their lives, the hassles groups, which is just the opposite of keeping a journal of blessings, whether it was a true control condition or some other set of instructions, there were comparisons between the gratitude focus and the other various focuses that we implemented in these studies. And some of these people, actually the majority were healthy, free from illness, free from disease. Others had a, a chronic uh, disease state, chronically ill. Some were addicted, some were afflicted. You know, most were healthy. So a whole range, you know, we try to e expand the research as much as possible because we don't want to just show it's limited to a certain type of person in a certain life situation that is available potentially to everyone. So gratitude journaling, this is where it all began. We would do these studies that would range from two weeks to three weeks to a month to 10 weeks, asking people to keep these journals over these varying amounts of time. While they're doing this, we're also asking them to rate their lives. How are, how are their lives going at the time? Are they happy? Are they unhappy? How, how stressed are they? Um, how do they feel about the next day? We were getting measures of their health during the time, exercise, sleep quality, sleep quantity, uh, aches and pains, physical symptoms, ratings of uh, loneliness, isolation. Basically, we got a nice cross sampling of their emotional, relational, and physical well-being during the time in which they were keeping these journals. So we could do comparisons between these groups. We could also do pre and post comparisons within each group if that was our focus for our data analyses. So let me just share with you some of the findings. Uh, just to summarize, basically, we found three categories of benefits to gratitude journaling, psychological, physical, and relational. So psychologically, people would report feeling more alive, alert, attentive, enthusiastic, more interested. Uh, it, it seemed to uh, bring benefits in the, in the psychological domain, which I will also include emotional under psychological. So people did report greater levels, greater, le greater levels of happiness, of contentment, of feelings of peace, feelings of joy. Uh, less feelings of stress, of depression, of anxiety. So psychological effects that range between 10 and 20%, depending upon the outcome that we measured. Physical effects, such as exercise increases. When people were keeping gratitude journals, they actually were more active physically. They went out and exercised more compared to people in the other conditions. They were bothered less by everyday aches and pains, reported fewer physical uh, symptoms. Relationally, it's one of the biggest and most impressive findings, I thought, was the relational effects of gratitude journaling. They're doing a very private uh, activity or task. They're just focusing on what they're grateful for, doing that by themselves. But it turns out this really impacted the quality of their relationships. They felt closer, more connected to others. They felt less lonely, less isolated. They actually became more helpful. People who knew them uh, gave us reports back. We contacted peers, we contacted partners, roommates, people who knew these research participants, and we asked them various questions about them to fill out what we call an informant report. It turned out that they were seen as actually more helpful, more outgoing, uh, if they were in the gratitude condition. So it was really cool you can verify this, go beyond the self-reports. And you know, pretty significant differences, 8% to 33%. We're talking about um, moderate uh, effect sizes. Uh, either pre or post, or also between groups. So, um, you know, each study found some different findings, but uh, there's never been a study which has not found some consequence, measurable, quantifiable consequence to keeping a gratitude journal. Let me show you a slide which has six panels, which each of which describes a different set of findings in the science of gratitude. So in one slide, six panels, we're talking about many, many studies over a long period of time, examining the link between gratitude and some of these outcomes, whether it's psychological, relational, physical. Look at the one on the bottom lower left, for example, grateful people are less depressed. This has been replicated in several studies that gratitude is effective in reducing the length of depressive episodes in uh, making people more resilient so they're less likely to get depressed uh, in the future. So shortening episodes and reducing the frequency of episodes, at least from mild to moderate forms of depression. We know that grateful people handle stress better, both 
minor everyday, what I call the slow drip of everyday stress, as well as the big stuff, the traumatic stress, the, the huge personal catastrophes and upheavals. Grateful people are more resilient to these forms of trauma. They handle this better if they are grateful. So we're talking now about a trait of gratitude beyond the practice of gratitude, which we also measure through our questionnaires. The GQ, particularly gratitude questionnaire, is a reliable way of measuring people's level of dispositional or trait gratitude. They get along better with other people. They, they pay it forward. You see the orange uh, panel in the, on the right there. There's studies showing that grateful people give back more. They're more generous. They're more giving. They're more forgiving. Just another one of the benefits of the grateful uh, life and the practice of gratitude. Let me just go back if I can and just, just want to summarize and say, you know, pretty much every domain that's been examined, gratitude shows a positive effect that grateful minds and grateful lives seem to reap a massive advantage. I mean, I haven't yet found a domain where, where grateful people are doing worse. Uh, that gratitude, you know, is a strength that seems to bring about benefits and virtually every domain so far that's been examined. It's really hard to overplay the hand of gratitude. I mean, it might happen at some point where they start to find some, you know, uh, counterintuitive findings, but so far things have fallen out the way we expect them to. If we move to the domain of health more so than subjective health, kind of the latest generation of research is really starting to examine uh, biologically verifiable endpoints, so, so clinically verifiable outcomes. It's really the second generation of research. It's really exciting. A lot of the early research was more subjective, that people felt better, they had less pain, aches, they reported feeling uh, more energetic, and so on, but we couldn't really verify that biologically. But now a whole bunch of new studies have come around and found things that, for example, grateful people have lower blood pressure, measurably. Uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure. They have healthier lipid panels. They have higher levels of high density lipoprotein, lower levels of triglycerides, lower levels of low density lipoprotein. It's just amazing. It just blows your mind when you start to see some of these findings that are coming out almost on, on a weekly basis from people, you know, examining uh, in clinical settings, largely with chronically ill populations, the correlates of gratitude both the trait of gratitude as well as changes that occur in health practices and in physiological outcomes when people are journaling for gratitude or doing other activities which are designed to activate uh, a grateful uh, framework, grateful uh, lens by which they look at life. So if sleep, for example, we found many studies now, there's about six studies find that grateful people sleep better. They wake up, they feel more refreshed. They're bothered less by everyday sleep dysfunctions. That's really cool. Reduce smoking and reduce alcohol use. I mean, measure after measure, the studies are showing that gratitude and grateful people are less likely to engage in health damaging behaviors, risky behaviors, and more likely to engage in health promoting or positive health behaviors. So the, the direction of those findings is also very similar. And you start to see a pattern. You start to build a case for why gratitude is in fact good medicine. As Mr. Jowett said, you know, over 100 years ago, we can quantify these. They've been quantified for those of you who like, you know, the metrics and want to be able to specify, well, what percent difference does it make if I practice gratitude or if my clients or patients practice gratitude? Here's just a handful of, there's about 14 good findings right now on specific metrics examining the impact of gratitude on things like reduced depression levels. Uh, in patients as well as healthcare practitioners, lower levels of stress hormones. I mean, you can read that. Those are just a few of the findings. Better nutrition. Grateful people eat more healthy. Uh, reduce their fat intake. Uh, findings showing that among people who are at risk for dementia, that when they start to practice for gratitude, it increases their verbal fluency. Uh, they have an easier time coming up with words and um, associations to words suggesting it's decelerating or slowing down the effects of neurodegeneration. I mean, that's, that's very important. I mean, that's just amazing that there would be this many uh, measurable findings. In fact, just yesterday, I just came across an article yesterday that looked at fasting glucose levels and found that gratitude negatively predicted 
fasting glucose levels, which is good because fasting glucose is a precursor and indic indicative of prediabetes, which is a risk factor for uh, mortality, this fasting glucose. So, I mean, study after study is finding that gratitude is associated with good outcomes, health, wellness, wholeness, fullness, and now in very quantifiable and sustainable ways. It's no longer just saying that you're doing better, life is better, you feel better when you're grateful. Actually, you can measure these using uh, traditional clinical outcomes. For example, measures of inflammation. I'm gonna talk about two studies next, very specific studies, each of which was published last year, so pretty new. One was with patients with heart failure, stage B heart failure, so they're asymptomatic, but they're at high risk for developing uh, heart failure. This was 186 patients studied uh, at the University of San Diego uh, Medical Center. I think actually it was multiple sites, but the um, primary authors were at UC San Diego uh, Medical Center and found that the trait of gratitude predicted lower levels of inflammatory biomarkers, the, the, the traditional risk factors, measures of inflammation, like C-reactive protein, like tumor necrosis factor, like interleukin-6. So they had you know, the, the, the basic uh, clinical markers of inflammation, heart disease is of course a uh, disease of inflammation, all of which suggests you know, that gratitude might be very beneficial in reducing risk of inflammation and potentially reducing uh, subsequent risk for heart disease. They also found, by the way, that patients who were grateful believed that they had more power to control the symptoms of their disease. They showed greater what they call cardiac self-efficacy. Very important, right? Can I do something to reduce my likelihood of um, having heart disease? And if I feel confident in my ability to do so, I'm more likely to take those preventive actions. And in fact, grateful people were more likely to do that. So that was published uh, just about a year ago, I believe it was February or March of uh, 2015. Very exciting study. Uh, another study came out very important because it showed that not only could you improve the health of patients with these graduate interventions, but also their doctors and healthcare practitioners. What's good for the patient also appears to be good for the healthcare providers. You know, I mean, the science is fairly young right now, uh, but healthcare practitioners you know, it's a prime population for studying mental health just because of the high rates of stress, the high rates of burnout, the high rates of depressive symptoms, the high rates of suicide. I won't go into all the numbers right there, but a lot of um, healthcare providers and health maintenance organizations are very interested in the effects of these studies of gratitude just because it, they offer promise for reducing some of these adverse outcomes. And at the same time, by the same token, improving patient care, which is what it's all about. So this was a double-blind randomized controlled trial conducted in five public hospitals. They did a follow-up up to three months post-treatment. They had them keep a journal twice a week for four weeks, just twice a week, writing down things they were grateful for, twice a week compared to hassles and a no-treatment control for the period of one month. This was in you know, one of the leading journals, Consulting Clinical Psychology, last year. Here's the research design. They began with 125 participants. Some were physicians, some were nurses. I think they had physical therapists, occupational therapists, uh, and people who are you know, generally working and providing services in healthcare settings. Randomized to one of three conditions, the gratitude diaries, a hassles diary, or no treatment control. Uh, 34 made it to the end, that's the study flow chart right there. And these were the instructions. This was the instruction for the gratitude condition. This is very typical for gratitude journaling studies. You know, you're just asked to focus on things that you're thankful for, maybe given some examples of uh, blessings or good things that you might not otherwise notice or perhaps you take for granted, but focus on those and write those down. What good things happened to, do to you today that you are thankful for? And there were a couple of examples. Maybe a colleague uh, switched to uh, swap schedules with you. Maybe a patient said thank you for you know, your, your attention and your help and your kindness, and maybe they were thankful for that. Okay, so that was the gratitude condition. Hassle's instructions, so you know what a hassle is, what's going wrong, what made them feel annoyed or irritated, uh, and so forth. Maybe 
patient complained or you know um, otherwise was difficult and these sorts of things appeared on the list of those who were in the hassles condition well it turned out that there was an effect of gratitude journaling compared to the conditions on the two basic outcome measures one of which was depression and that's in the panel on the left so the physicians and other healthcare providers who were keeping a gratitude journal showed a decline in depression scores from when the study ended up to even three to four months later the study went on a month but there was a sustainable impact where depression levels decreased compared to the other two control comparison conditions similar finding with respect to stress which is on the right hand panel perceived stress no difference when the study began a difference was observed when the study was concluded a month later that was still in effect three months later than four months from the beginning of the study where those who were keeping the gratitude journal saw themselves as significantly less stressed compared to the other two conditions so i mean a minor intervention talking about twice a week for four weeks, eight times of filling out those reports was enough to sustainably and significantly reduce both depression and stress months down the road. The authors of the article concluded that, you know, this is a really great thing. It can help reduce stress, depressive symptoms amongst healthcare practitioners with the bottom line being this is gonna improve their productivity. It's gonna improve the quality of patient service. I mean, why wouldn't every single healthcare provider be interested in the findings of a study like this? It just seems like a no brainer. Right, it's good for the patients, but it's also good for the providers, and the providers are much more likely to recommend this practice for their patients if they themselves see the benefit. So those are just two illustrations of specific studies, both published in the last year, finding you know clear, significant, uh, measurable, sustainable effects of practicing gratitude. Some of the findings are I found quite surprising as I start to review some of these and I, these come across my desk. If I'm not directly involved with them, I certainly become familiar with them uh, once they're published or I review these studies. Uh, three, at least non-obvious benefits of gratitude. I think one is the sleep finding. The fact that a half a dozen studies have found that gratitude improves sleep quality and sleep quantity. You know, we know collectively we're deprived as a nation in terms of sleep. Uh, there's huge personal and societal costs to, to loss of sleep just in terms of accidents and safety, accident prevention at work. The biggest cause of that is uh, sleep deprivation. So, you know, if you have something that can improve sleep like gratitude where there's no side effects and low cost and easily implemented, I mean, that's important information. Again, everyone would want to know that and potentially benefit from that. Self-esteem, that's a, a, an unusual or non-obvious benefit of gratitude. But when people are focusing on what they're grateful for, they feel better about themselves. They feel affirmed and validated. <clears throat> when you look at people who are supporting you, right, you're less likely to struggle to get their approval, their affection, their admiration, because they're already giving you attention. They're already making your concern their concern. It's like, these people are doing nice things for me. I must have some value as a person, right? You feel affirmed and sustained by the help, support of other people. And this feeds, this nourishes and nurtures our self-esteem. And there's a few studies that have examined actually explicitly the link between gratefulness and higher self-esteem. So that's really cool. And then self-control. That's a trick we haven't taught our dogs at home yet to do, but there's um, dogs out there who learn that you know, great self-control. Uh, they can resist temptation. It turns out that grateful people have a willpower. They can resist temptation. They're more likely to forgo an immediate reward for a larger reward at some future point. And this has lots of implications, not just in terms of the usual sort of like like, for instance, investments where you can, you know, not spend money today, invest it and make more money down the road. Potentially, hopefully it works out that way. But also a lot of health behaviors, you know, exercise now because you might experience a benefit later on. Forgo something right now because, you know, there could be some short term negative consequences, but long term positive consequences. Turns out when people are in a grateful mood, they're more likely to make these good decisions, good long term decisions. They show more patience or greater self-control. So three S's, three surprising findings of the benefits of gratitude, extending and expanding what we're already learning in perhaps some less surprising domains. 
So when you put it all together, I come to this conclusion, which is what I've been uh, using this phrase to kind of summarize the science of gratitude over the last 10 years, that gratitude heals, energizes, and transforms lives. Uh, more succinctly, gratitude works. Every day and in every way, what we're uh, experiencing and observing and discovering are the benefits in people's lives. You start to wonder though, how does it all work? What's the mechanism? Right? I mean, science must explain the why, the how, not just describe the findings. So there are studies that are trying to explore this idea. How does gratitude get inside? How does it get under the skin to affect health and, and well-being? Perhaps even longevity, although those studies haven't come out yet. We know there's studies on happiness and, and longevity. We know there's studies on optimism versus pessimism and longevity so it's just a matter of time before we start seeing that you know grateful people live longer than people who are less grateful what's the mechanism what's happening inside how is gratitude affecting you know physiological systems and so i have a couple of ways of explaining that usually this slide is met with a bunch of uh, moans and groans and sometimes some chuckles it's like whoa that's way too uh, complicated you know can we unpack that or dissect that I'd like to show this one because there are serious scientists who are trying to examine it at many different levels of analysis the chemical pathways and the um, electrical pathways you know in the brain and nervous system and the hormonal system as well as the immune system for example a stress pathway at the bottom by which gratitude can reduce stress by reducing a cortisol response to stress in the HPA network, for example, increasing um, positive hormones like uh, DHEH, uh, DHEA rather, increasing vagal tone, which is a measure of parasympathetic activity. So the relax response, relaxation response, gratitude is very important for that reason alone. There's a group that's examining cellular aging, looking at telomeres and telomerase and looking at how that might relate to gratitude. So that's one pathway. There are various other ones as well. I don't want you to, to memorize this or to worry about that because this is some of this is being tested. Some of it is more promissory. It's kind of like we know these might be good things to look at, but we haven't exactly explored the mechanisms definitively yet. The way I like to describe it, when I talk to more general audiences and actually even to professionals, they, they like the complex view, but they like the, I think, the more easily digestible view as well. So I say that gratitude works for three reasons. And I call this the arc of gratitude. And that's the picture on the right. It's, a, it's an electrical arc. Uh, that gratitude amplifies. So that's the A in arc. That gratitude rescues. So rescue is the R in arc. And that gratitude connects. C being a connection. C in the arc. So let's look at each of those three uh, briefly. So one of the reasons why gratitude is beneficial, the gratitude works, is that it amplifies the good. It magnifies or amplifies the good. And we know that when we have an amplifier, it amplifies sound, right? Pumps up the, vol the volume on the sound. When we have a magnifying glass or when we, we put on our reading glasses, it magnifies the print so that we can see it. It makes it larger, bigger. Uh, it makes the good more noticeable. We're more likely to see that now not likely to take it for granted, which is the problem with the lack of gratitude is that we don't see things, we don't notice them, they're small, we take them for granted, and so on. So gratitude helps us see the good by amplifying it, turning up the volume, the good in our lives, the good that we see around us, the good in other people that we might otherwise not notice or take for granted. I mean, this is hugely important, amplifying the good, focusing on the good, noticing uh, the good. In some respects, this is a, a metaphor that I've used. I think it's kind of cool. I don't know. Um, I, it's useful to think in terms of metaphors. You know, I, I've referred to gratitude in the past as the ultimate performance enhancing substance. I think that's a very powerful metaphor because it does enhance performance in so many different domains. Uh, another one is that gratitude is fertilizer for the mind. That gratitude helps in spreading connections and in, in, in growing, you know, connections in the mind, improving its function in nearly every realm of experience. And I mean, that's really cool to think about it that way. It's something that you know, we can practice and it can help grow connections in our mind because when we practice something in our mind, it actually, you know, it embeds it more deeply. Uh, for example, if you, if you ask your brain to do algebra every day, it gets, gets better at doing algebra. 
if you ask your mind to find things to worry about, you get better at being anxious every day, right? Uh, well, if you ask your mind to give thanks every day, you should get better at becoming grateful, right? Find more things to be grateful for if it becomes a regular practice. And I think that's the case. One of the reasons why gratitude is so strong is because it helps spread and grow connections between uh, aspects of the brain. They're actually doing some neuroscience studies now looking at what you know, brain structures, what's the neural architecture of gratitude. It's very new research. There's only been one or two published studies, but it's going to be, I think, this next phase, next generation of gratitude science is going to be exploring more of the neurophysiology, also the neurochemistry of uh, gratefulness. Okay, number two, gratitude works because it rescues us. It rescues us. What does it rescue us from? Well, it rescues us from negativity, from resentment, from ungratefulness, from entitlement, from a sense of victimhood or victimization. Okay, so all things which get in the way, which block us from being able to experience joy, contentment, fullness, wholeness, wellness, happiness, uh, easily derail us. They easily hijack our consciousness and get us off course. And so we need something that can rescue us. You know, if you go to any talk, listen to any talk on positive psychology, at some point, the speaker will bring up the negativity bias. You know, the notion that I'm sure that's familiar to all of you listening right now, that, uh, that bad is stronger than good. We're more likely to notice what's going wrong than what's going right. That uh, disappointment is much greater than delight. Pain is greater than pleasure. Complaint greater than compliment. And so on. We have a lot of forces out there that are telling us to notice, pay attention to the bad, focus on what's going wrong. We hear that continually and perpetually, all the ways in which life disappoints us. So we need a force which counteracts that. We need a countervailing force to magnify the good, to rescue us from this bad. And that is gratitude. That's why gratitude works. One of the reasons why it is so effective is because it is a counteractive force. We ask people who are mildly depressed why gratitude brings them benefits. What good does it do to look at life through a grateful lens when they are depressed? And these are some examples of what people actually said about why gratitude frees them. It frees them from the burden of negativity. Here they are. They're depressed. Life is burdensome. Life is oppressive. They need to be rescued from that negativity. And they say that they feel better about their life. They feel luckier. It brings a smile to their face. It helps the negativity go away. It makes them feel safer, more secure, uh, more positive, right? It makes life freer, fuller, and lighter, and easier, which is all what we want when we're feeling burdened and, and, and heavy and enslaved by our negative, whether it comes from the inside or whether it comes from the outside, no matter what the source is, gratitude is effective. It helps rescue us from negativity. So that's number two. Oh, I want to share this with you. Um, I know a lot of you know what paranoia is, right? Paranoia, the belief that other people are conspiring against you. There's actually an opposite uh, clinical state known as pronoia which is the belief that others are conspiring to help you. I believe that other people want good things to occur for me, that there are forces out there that want to benefit me, that there is benevolence in the world that I can experience, that I can tap into this good favor that can come my way if only I notice that and take it in, become aware of it. So that's a little cartoon there where you see she's receiving a present you know, from a tree, the sun is drying up the rain, the mailbox is bringing her good news. The squirrel is giving her an award. The frog is pushing a log in her path so she won't get wet. So that's what grateful people do. They notice good things. They're pronoids. They believe that the world is conspiring on their behalf, not against them, but rather for them. They're looking for and noticing the good. And then lastly, the C in the arc is that gratitude connects. Gratitude is really a relationship strengthening emotion. I think this is probably the most important reason why gratitude is effective. Because, you know, we do not and cannot exist alone. We require the help and assistance of uh, other people. Gratitude reminds us of other people who are out there, who are doing things for our benefit, who are supporting us and sustaining us. So it's really in the context of relationships where the power of gratitude 
shows itself. Conversely, or the lack of gratitude shows itself as well in the case where if we don't perceive we're being supported, you know, we're going to feel lonelier and more isolated. If we perceive we're being supported or if we're providing that support, giving back the goodness, it's strengthening, uh, making our bonds grow stronger and deeper and connecting us to other people. It becomes the fabric of our lives. Uh, they used to say in that, in that commercial about cotton, maybe you remember that, that, that cotton is the fabric of our lives. Uh, I don't think that's true. Though. Actually, I think it's gratitude is the fabric of our lives. And that's another one of these metaphors that can really help us think about the power and the, and the potential of why gratitude does what it does and why it works. So gratitude connects us. It takes us outside of ourselves. It shows us that there are other forces out there that we can connect to and tap into. And that has a lot of healing power uh, just by itself. Okay, so the very last part of this, we're, we're drawing toward the conclusion here. Thank you so much for your attention up to now. And I want to talk a little bit about how to get more gratitude. So we looked at what it is, what it does, why it works, and now how to get more of it, how to tap into that healing power of gratitude. There are a lot of different techniques and strategies and things that we can do that, you know, turn our minds to noticing ways we're supported by others. Uh, I like to focus, though, on a good place to start for most people is just writing down, keeping a journal. Uh, it's the starting point for a lot of individuals. And people can you know, begin right where they're at. No matter where they're at right now, they can take out a journal. They can write it down. They can uh, talk to other people about it. They can post it through social media, three or four or five things in their lives that they're grateful for. Uh, I call this the wear, declare, and share model of gratitude. It's always cool to rhyme, of course, but in case that rhyming also sometimes is effective when it describes exactly what one should be doing. So you become aware of your gratitude. You notice it. You focus on the good. You take in that good. See ways in which you're supported by other people. You declare that by writing it down, by taking those thoughts, what you notice, translate those into language. Uh, studies show it's very effective to make those concrete and real, to write them down. It's just kind of labeling of our of our thoughts and of our feelings and then share them with others whether you know you are doing that um, online through social media whether you talk to other people about it uh, it's very effective also it just it just creates a stronger link than between thinking about something being important than actually doing it kind of trying to reduce that gap between uh, knowing and doing this performance gap and we all have that in different ways in different domains most people say yeah gratitude is a good idea Sure, my life would be better if I was practicing gratitude, but I just have so many other things that get in the way that compete. It's hard to find time to practice gratitude. Well, you can do it anytime, any place, anywhere. It's easy to do. You don't need a special journal. You don't need a special time of the day. You can practice, start wherever you're at. The thing to do, though, to really optimize this process and practice is to do what I call the three S's. Specificity, surprise, and scarcity. So write very specifically. The more specific, the better. Write specifically what someone did for you, not just the fact that you're grateful to you know, your spouse, but what exactly did your spouse do on a particular day that you're grateful for? Your doctor, what did they do that you're grateful for? Right? The more specific, the better, because the truth is in the details. Surprise, what happened today that was surprising? You didn't expect it, you, you, got a, you got a gift from someone. Someone noticed, someone did something, complimented you, that came out of nowhere. Sometimes that's the best occasion for gratitude are those things which are unexpected, novel, surprising. And then scarcity is just focusing what's very rare, very unusual. Uh, we appreciate things more when they're scarce, when they're rare. Obviously a precious stone is worth more just because it's rare and it's unusual, so add, use the principle of scarcity to magnify and maximize your gratitude. The three S's, specificity, surprise, and scarcity. And I say a lot more about these in my book, Gratitude Works. I have a whole section about, a whole chapter actually on, on optimizing gratitude journaling. The beautiful thing about gratitude, and I mentioned this before, is that you know it's available to everyone, that everyone can practice that. Uh, on a regular basis. It, it begins with this choice, uh, a conscious everyday decision that we can choose gratitude. When people make this choice, it might be hard the first time if it's a way of life that it's unusual or not typical for them. And this might be difficult at first, but what they find is that it, it tends to reinforce itself. It tends to be self-sustaining. The second time they do it, the choice is easier. 
the third time, fourth time, it's, it becomes easier and easier. What happens is that people's gratitude lists get longer and longer and longer as they find more and more things to be grateful for. Because you can make this choice literally any occasion. And at almost any moment in our lives, we can choose gratitude, even though it might seem that's difficult. If we work at it, we find that it's possible to choose gratitude. I like to um, sometimes talk about individuals uh, because I think that's really where you see the power of gratitude. I mean, the studies are great. The science is vital. We need to have the, you know, the coefficients. We need to do all our statistics. We need to do our randomized controlled trials. But occasionally, it's also nice, though, to consider the lives of real people who have learned that gratitude works, that gratitude is transformative, that it can make a huge difference. Several years ago, I was contacted by Clara Morabito. She was at the time in her late 80s. She began practicing gratitude at about this time when she was 87 years old. And she swore that gratitude changed her life. That before practicing gratitude, you know, she had a lot of issues related to, you know, mental health challenges, related to aging, related to frailness and disability. And she came across some of our research on gratitude. And she wrote to me and she wanted me to know how much it had impacted her, how much it had changed her life. She became a spokesperson for gratitude, actually. She started to give talks in her community where she lived at the time in Florida, and then she moved to New Jersey to be closer to her family. She gave talks uh, in the local community about the power of gratitude. She composed a poem that became part of her daily meditations. It was entitled, I Choose, and you see it there, a very simple poem. She included as part of her daily meditations and three or four times a day, she would recite this and talk about how this gave her energy, this gave her vitality, this calmed her, this reduced her depression, this, this uh, so many positive benefits she experienced herself from the practice of gratitude. She, she shared this with as many people as possible from her doctors to strangers she ran into. It was just amazing to see the transformation that this made that she reported uh, in her own life. This was Clara's choice to practice gratitude. She swore that gratitude was going to help her to live to be 100, right? And uh, it turned out she lived to about 95. She passed away last year at the age of 95. So it did prolong her life. She didn't quite make it, but she had a, a rich, a full life, a, a, a quality of life that was unsurpassed. And she believed, and I believe her, that it was largely due to discovering the power of gratitude in her last uh, remaining years. So a great spokesperson for the healing power, transformative power of gratitude. So if you wanna go deeper, I've written a couple of books. Uh, Thanks was my first one, uh, How Practicing Gratitude Can Make You Happier. Gratitude Works, I, I tell Clara's story in the first chapter of Gratitude Works, which came out a couple of years ago. <clears throat> and this summer will be the next one, uh, my next book will be The Little Book of Gratitude. It will come out in July of this year. It's really focused much more on the practices. It's still science-based, as the other two were, but it has between 30 and 40 specific exercises and practices, very manageable, very bite-sized little morsels that you can you know, take and read and practice and digest and really start to implement, I think, in your own life and experience some of these benefits of gratitude that Clara experience for herself that now thousands of people around the world who are in these studies are experiencing <clears throat> as well. So <clears throat> if you'd like to contact me, I'm happy to uh, respond to any questions you might have. That's my email contact information right there. I have a Twitter account if you want to follow me uh, on Twitter. Sometimes I post some things about gratitude and the latest science as I do on my Gratitude Works Facebook page. Glad to connect with you that way. Um, glad to hear about your stories, your insights. You know, one other thing I've noticed is that everyone has a story about gratitude. No matter who you are, people experience it. They want to share their stories about gratitude and what it means to them in their lives. And it's just a really fun topic to study. And I'm just so grateful for that opportunity and grateful for, for you guys that you're here, that you're listening to this. And I wish you well in your journey toward grateful living. So thank you. Thank you.